Um, <clears throat> but thank you everyone for um, coming to this final review of this long, um, intense independent study. Um, I am Sal, and to start off, for those of you who don't know me, um, as there are a few new people here, um, I am a fifth year architecture student, soon to graduate, um, with a sort of deep interest in games, vi um, films, and animation. Um, and for the past three or so years, I've been using Unreal Engine as sort of my main tool for um, architectural visualization. And so this independent study sort of spawned from the desire to kind of explore that further as a tool for, um, um, as a tool for sort of exploring how it can be used to sort of expand the way we visualize things um, in a more narrative sense. Um, and just to go over the additional kind of vast amount of people who sort of participated in this, um, there's Alyssa Moyer who sort of laid the framework for this independent study um, with hers before mine, um, as well as my advisors, uh, Freddie Freeman, who was my main advisor for this semester, um, so with a lot of the user and VR research, Andrew, who was my main advisor for last semester, um, who helped with much of the visualization type stuff, um, Eli Tuttle and Jason Kirk, um, who were both there to sort of provide critique and guidance on both sort of the planning and the actual like visual narrative aspects of it. Um, and then Turkey as well, who I worked sort of in parallel with um, last semester as we had fairly similar um, independent studies. And then Mike Fennell and the rest of OIR who provided me with the VR backpack that was used for um, sort of testing this entire project. Um, and then there's a whole list of other people from various years and other schools who kind of were used as my testers um, in whatever way possible for testing this actual experience. Um, so to start off, this presentation will be broken down into four specific categories. Um, we'll start off going through sort of a little bit of the work done last semester, just for some context, go through the narrative and images that were produced for this semester's work. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the user research of it. And then we'll go through um, showcasing the actual final of uh, your experience and sort of talk about that entire process as well. So getting started with the visualization aspect, um, last semester really focused on sort of creating for the sake of creating and just really sort of exploring Unreal Engine from a narrative sense. Um, we did a bunch of basically weekly strats where the end goal was essentially having a uh, animated image that um, really focused on whatever we were talking about for that week. Um, so for instance, with this one, we were focusing a lot on the atmosphere of the image um, and as we moved forward, we started talking more about the camera's placement, as well as different influences of different films and such to really bring into it, um, as well as as we started focusing on the process, um, recording time lapses to really document that process fairly easily. And then moving forward, um, this sort of next image was really more focused on the process as a sort of back and forth between sketching, modeling, and resketching a whole lot um, as we sort of started to build out the narrative. Um, and so the narrative that was built out from last semester sort of follows this space explorer who after a brief, heart, uh, um, brief hyperdrive malfunction gets flung to an unknown planet and ends up finding herself in front of a mysterious stone obelisk that when interacted with um, essentially transports her consciousness into those of other people who are interacting with it at the same time, um, creating this sort of multiverse of um, these different pylons um, with which the whole intent behind the narrative itself um, was really to sort of explore um, the architecture's place in the story, viewing the pylon as sort of the main character of the entire story um, and sort of that piece of architecture's impact on the environment around it and the people around it. Um, and so um, we'll move now into the narrative aspect of sort of the final images for the semester as it continued. Um, everything from this semester is essentially a continuation off of everything produced in the fall. Um, so it starts off in this sort of white void astral plane filled with these black rocks um, where 
the main character of the story or the user, as this is a VR experience, um, has no real choice but, but to go forward, um, where they find a strange black pyramid and sort of voices compelling them to interact with it. Um, and before they can interact with it, um, they are um, transported um, as if remembering something into this cave um, where it seems like they're trapped with the exception of some light pointing them towards an opening in the cave. And after essentially crawling through a very tight tunnel, um, they come to an opening in which they see a um, essentially the entrance to the temple of a temple where there's two holes that overlook a waterfall as well as a decrepit, um, slightly destroyed ancient civilization. After traveling through the temple itself, they come to a grand hall of which um, giant columns are uh, scattered around, um, all covered in ancient texts and hieroglyphs, um, essentially telling the story of this ancient civilization, all depicted alongside some mysterious black pylon. Um, and then upon arriving to the library um, adjacent to that hall where they find essentially more context on it, um, as well as additional depictions of that pyramid pylon shape um, accompanied by another structure and various symbols. And then as they take a crumbling path, um, leading them towards a triangular door, um, upon approach, the door opens itself, um, essentially welcoming them in as if it was expecting them to arrive. Um, where they are greeted by a large stone obelisk that rests at the very back of a large sanctuary type room. Um, once again, um, sort of voices start to fill the user's mind, sort of compelling them forward, where upon interaction with said pylon, um, they are transported back into this sort of white void, um, as if looking back at that um, mountain off in the distance. Um, so before we go into the user research, um, I will ask, if there are just any brief questions, just for clarity on what was already presented, um, just in case anyone is at all slightly confused before we kind of get further into this. All right, cool. Um, so now into the user research phase. Um, pretty much this entire semester was really more so focused on the actual user research aspect of this experience, more so than the actual production of it. Um, all of which was done alongside um, Freddie Freeman with all of his guidance. Um, definitely would have not been as in-depth as it is um, with all, out all of his resources. Um, so starting off in the semester, um, we really didn't um, pursue actually producing anything until about halfway or so through the semester. Um, and we really sort of started exploring and asking ourselves, who can we test? What are we testing for? Um, and really investigating things like instincts, how do people calibrate themselves in VR, um, everything from sound cues to figuring out, you know, who to test from students all the way to people like my parents who have never really experienced VR before. Um, we also went through an experience landscape where we sort of analyzed other VR experiences and sort of what did they do successfully as well as what did they do unsuccessfully to really determine sort of what was important to the experience to try and maintain and what should be completely avoided. And then on top of that, we essentially took the original narrative from last semester um, and explored breaking it up in a nonlinear way. Um, and here we were really exploring a more so looping narrative. Um, so as you saw in the end of the narrative, it starts in that sort of white void and then ends in the white void again. Um, sort of intending to act as an endless loop where hopefully each time you kind of view it, you can learn something new um, and experience it in a different way every single time. We also did some empathy mapping um, in which I effectively went through every single space um, and the experience as a whole and tried to really explore sort of um, what does the user think? What do they feel? Um, and really kind of explore each space on its own to try and understand it as much as possible. There was also the user flow and really exploring how does the person using this experience move through it? Where do they start? How do they feel when they start? What are they interacting with? As well as sort of the different things they're seeing or learning throughout the entire experience. 
Um, and then onwards towards the actual experience um, and sort of the process and production of it. Um, to create the entire thing, I used the VR backpack provided by OIR, along with which included an Oculus Quest and the HP ZVR backpack, as well as my personal computer um, and occasionally my personal Oculus Rift S. Um, and alongside those, I primarily used Unreal Engine for all the visualization and technical stuff and Blender for all the modeling. Um, these were a few sort of brief storyboards when initially trying to explore um, the entire idea and the experience. Um, and as you'll see as it progresses, um, it took a very, a few very large turns off of what's presented here. Um, so it sort of starts off, um, as I said earlier, with that sort of white void that sort of acts as the beginning of and the end. Um, here, this area was very simple. Um, and a lot of the user research we did, uh, the main issue we found was sort of that it was a little bit too big. And when starting, um, you know, whoever was using it didn't exactly know at first that like there was something else for them to find, which sort of led to the usage of these rocks to kind of push them in a certain direction, but also having that large mountain in the background to sort of act as some kind of waypoint to head towards. Um, and then in that sort of initial cave space, um, this had a similar issue of kind of user direction. Um, coincidentally enough, as I had my dad testing this, he spent about five minutes sort of teleporting around, not really realizing that there was a tunnel that he had to like progress through. Um, and that led to sort of adding in the light and some audio cues to try and like really strengthen that area as somewhere to progress towards. Um, and then moving towards this temple entry, um, at this point, you know, one of the main things we were discussing was really the user immersion and the entire experience um, and sort of the role of each room. So that sort of starting off astral plane area, as well as that starting cave um, are really intended to act as sort of like the tutorial areas for the user to kind of get their feet wet, um, sort of as a, hey, look, you're in VR type thing. Um, whereas this sort of temple entrance area really acts as sort of the threshold into the greater experience and the actual narrative of the entire VR experience, um, where hopefully by the time they pass through it, they will be fully immersed um, and sort of invested in it and sort of forget that they're really just in a way um, experiencing some digital thing. And then as we move towards the gallery, this one um, was really an exploration of using the props and objects throughout the scene to really, um, explore how do we force someone from a linear perspective um, and get them to really explore the space, um, as well as sort of using those hieroglyphs and stuff to tell a story visually, um, which is where we actually also lead into the library where originally the intent was to have just only like hieroglyphs, um, you know, just like all these Egyptian styled hieroglyphs scattered throughout to tell the story. Um, but there was soon a realization that not everyone is going to really understand um, whatever weird, you know, hieroglyphic cave drawings I might put into the experience. And so the library really served as an additional narrative element to um, really allow the user to kind of figure out the information where in theory, they could go ahead, pick up a book and um, it would essentially tell them like in plain English almost, um, you know, a little bit more clearly like what they're doing here um, and sort of what their goals are um, to really just have alternate ways of pushing along the user. Um, and then we come to this sort of final sanctuary door way, which took probably the most drastic change, um, especially from that uh, user research where um, the initial tests kind of revealed that it was very anticlimactic, which led to this sort of very detached space um, with a very large door with the intent to make it feel a lot more mysterious, but also have a lot more importance from everything else as it was directly detached from the main temple space, um, as well as having these very large doors. And then the final um, smaller sanctuary area, um, trying to relay as much as possible back to that first instance where the user sees the pylon um, and really just having a slightly more intimate space where there's only one clear objective for the user to have. Um, and that is pretty much everything for this entire semester. Um, before we go into the final sort of experience, um, 
any questions whatsoever, just for clarification or um, anything whatsoever. Awesome. So um, I will also add, um, as I have to start sharing sound too, um, I will just add for a slight um, headphone warning, um, simply because some of the sounds in this are a little bit loud. Um, so, you know, just in case you get startled. It seems like there's somebody whispering over your shoulder that's by design. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah. All right, so uh, that's basically it. I'm not sure why I continued there. Um, but yeah, so that's um, the entire experience. Um, any additional questions? Uh, yeah, you guys are free to comment. <laughs> Well, can you have the um, video play without sound during this next yeah. bit? Perhaps. So the the video we're watching, this is Jason Kirk, the video we're watching and that you just presented, um, was that you 
playing this or interacting with this while it was recording? Or was this one of your test participants? Is this kind of like rehearsed and choreographed to hit the notes? Or was it kind of somebody experiencing it and this is just what we gathered from that? Or could it be like a cut together of, of different people? Um, so this is me going through it, um, trying to kind of hit those specific notes um, and really just kind of trying to show it off as it's really me going through it, trying to like show off the narrative aspect of it. Um, sure. I kind of saw it as almost the uh, gameplay trailer in a sense right. for it. Um, but not then, necessarily the user experience of other people. Yeah, testing. the reason I ask is just because the the way that you presented this whole um, well presentation uh, is it kind of it pivots around that user testing to further iterate the um, to further iterate the final experience, right? So it would be neat to see kind of if you have the footage a cut together of people, you know, like your dad stumbling around mm -hmm. for a second and then the breakthrough. You know what I mean? Um, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, integral to the process, what you created here, and would be really interesting to see on the other side of the conversation about, you know, you creating this off of that testing experience, you know, just curious though, it looks yeah. good. Given another week, what would you do? Honestly another week i'm not really sure because to honestly like fully complete this project it'd probably take another few months um but no, i mean not i fully complete not fully yeah. complete. But um but 85%. i think i think i would probably try to spend a little bit more time working on like the visual narrative aspect of it um and as kirk said sort of um had cutting together other people using it um, to really kind of get that understanding of like the user experience on it. Right. Yeah, the putting, I think you're, you're probably even giving yourself less time than you need to fully finish it. I mean, a team, one of our teams at work would probably take for a space this size, as many narrative beats, you're talking six, six eight months with multiple, mm -hmm. with 20 people working on it daily. I mean, that's different departments and a different level of fidelity, but you still got a lot of stuff you can add and ways to push it. So Eli, uh, are you saying it's as hard to build a game as it is to build a building or harder? I'd say in some ways it's harder, some ways it's easier. Undo's great. <laughs> um, the, the no constraints, it kind of sends you off in bad directions. Um, it's probably yeah. harder to build a good game. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, than a functional building. Yeah. But, but Carol makes a um, reminding me of something I was going to ask. How did you um, kind of cope with the blank slate and the infinite possibilities versus what you do in your traditional architecture classes? Of here's your site. You have these programmatic constraints and these area constraints? Um, it was a slight mix of things. Um, so I usually always kind of referenced back towards the narrative that I worked on last semester as sort of like the guiding thread for it. Um, but it was also kind of a lot of kind of shifting my priorities for the most part, um, as we discussed a lot, you know, there's nowhere near enough time to really finish, like create a fully finished product for this for um, the end of the semester. So it was really a lot more of kind of shifting around what the end goal was for the final production um, to maintain the kind of full idea. Um, and so anytime I hit like a blank slate where I didn't know what to do, that was typically when I took it and I kind of just put it in front of someone else, either if it was a video walkthrough or if I like gave someone my personal headset and like had them go through it in person um, to kind of like figure out like what was missing that I wasn't seeing. So it's Barbara. Sorry that I was late. I was in another call and I had to take that um, other call. 
Um, and I'm not, I didn't, I wasn't able to see your presentation until the very, very end. Um, my question to you is, what are transferable skills that they learned here for your own profession? Um, so in terms of transferable skills, a lot of it, I think, was in terms of the iterative process, um, as I'll go up a little bit further, um, a lot of the process we explored um, last semester was a lot of constant sketching back to model, back to sketching. Um, so a lot of like the similar process to um, how would we actually go through designing a building, um, but also um, just sort of the ability to design the space, um, I think really helped. Um, it was really great having actually a greater understanding of sort of the different scales I could explore um, as just like the way to use the space. Um, something that I don't think I really would have been able to do as successfully without the previous five years of grinding out architecture projects. Um, so I think that really helped a lot for it. Um, especially, I mean, like throughout this entire project, um, we really started even thinking of architects really as user experience designers. Um, so it's really kind of that ability to picture ourselves in the space um, and really kind of think about like who's using it and like how they're using it. That goes to that goes to um, observations that Eli has made along the kind of now over a year long process that he's been joining us on with this for his um, professional experience and also kind of dovetails with um, observations that both Jason Kirk and Freddie Freeman have made about students transferring students from CABE taking animation classes, just speaking a different dialect of a language of three dimensions. Sal, you were talking about what you take from architecture into the VR world. What do you bring from the VR world back to architecture? Mm -hmm. um, Are you experiencing space in a way when you're designing it that makes it uh, more real that would then make an architecture project more successful potentially? Um, 100%. Um, so every single time someone sort of asks me this, I always uh, uh, decide to tell the story of the one review where a critic asked me how wide is 12 feet? Because um, I'm, you know, one of those students who's a little bit terrible at really understanding um, space in the real world. Um, and so, you know, he said, Sal, how do you know how wide 12 feet is? I was like, I don't know, it's about like that big. And it was like, it's about that big um, to, you know, show me that, you know, the size I had in my project wasn't big enough. Um, and so with this, um, being able to put the project to the VR for me um, really helps me sort of understand just how large a space I'm designing. Um, there were moments um, going through the entire process. Um, for instance, in this environment, this ledge um, for like weeks of the project, it was way too high um, for someone to look over until I finally put it into VR and like I actually understood like just how high it actually needed to be and how slightly out of scale my own scale figure was in the actual environment. Um, so for me, using VR just mostly really helps to kind of understand the scale of the space just more intimately and directly. Um, I think it also just sort of really helps to make the space come alive a little bit as a sort of presentation tool and like really sell things. And it's great for uh, site visits because you can do uh, Google Earth and VR. Sal, I just wanted you, if you could you go back up to the beginning of your presentation just to show all of the people that you've assembled. Uh, on slide yeah. Number four. Yeah, just to show that also for Dean Klinkheimer, just to, the amount of people. And actually, I'm also thinking that, you know, there's also some testers and some other folks that have started to interface with this, like um, one ink, there's an incoming student that got to check this out um, during an open house day, you know, from a social, like it was all she could do to hold herself back from kind of jumping in the middle of the game. But I was just wondering if you could go through this one more time. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of people sort of involved in this whole process. Um, and I'm sure there's some that I even kind of forgot to add to this list. Um, but in terms of like the foundation of this entire independent study, um, Alyssa Moyer sort of laid the framework with her own independent study. Um, and we could also say that Eli in turn also laid some framework with his thesis, um, sort of pushing the use of digital in the program. Um, then we have the advisors. So Freddie Freeman, who 
was my main advisor for this semester and sort of led and guided all of the user research aspects of it. Um, a lot of his resources were, were what sort of like went into like really making this as in depth as I could. Um, last semester with Andrew as my main advisor, um, who kind of really helped alongside the sort of narrative aspect of it and really kind of connecting films and such to it. Um, and then Eli and Kirk, who um, both kind of provided guidance on the critique, as well as sort of helping me plan and sort of figure out how to really produce this thing um, and sort of gauge my expectations throughout the entire thing. Um, and then there was Turkey, who last semester um, during the fall, we had kind of similar independent studies. So we sort of worked in parallel um, and really pushed each other along. Um, uh, and then there's Mike Fennell, who just messaged me and said that there's supposed to be two N's in his name. Um, so we'll fix that. <laughs> Um, and the rest of OIR who provided uh, the VR backpack to me for use in terms of all the testing with this project. Um, and then all of the additional testers who were a mix of um, students um, within K, both upper and lower years, um, as well as my family and um, some other uh, students who are alumni of other universities um, that are all sort of not even like that close to design stuff. Thanks, Sal. I also want to. I also just want to point out that, um, you know, this didn't impact Sal's project directly, but also helping to lay the foundations for students like Alyssa, but also lining up resources with um, um, the IST OIR team, um, Daniel Ship's work in VR, um, Jeff Seeples uh, and Mike Fennell and Peter's um, support, and Andrea Brown's support of um, doing the VR work in the library, but also at the um, at uh, EDUCAUSE conference. Kim Tans, who is a graduate in our program. Um, a lot of uh, uh, hats off to Golden Denise for her VR research, which was informative on this, because um, this runs this runs parallel to her research. It's a different, it, it's for a different, different purpose, but um, we share a lot of information on it. And, um, and then also I wanna shout out to a bunch of the undergrad students that are here, the younger undergrad students that are here that are interested in animation, that are interested in um, these types of things that were involved in explorations and a second year level. So we have, um, we have Orson Nguyen, we have uh, Brenna Carley, we have um, Owen Felty is here, Emma Bormschlag, Molly Bradley. I, there's, a, there's a, Valorin is here. Valdez. I'm just glad that these students could stop in and there's other students that wanted to be here but have finals today. Sorry, I didn't mean that for that to be an awkward pause. I'm, I'm done talking and we can go back to having architecture <laughs> questions. Um, so when you started, like if you can just kind of give a, a, when did you start with this project um, formally? And when did you start thinking that you wanted to do a project like this to kind of build out this experience? Because I think that's another really important aspect of this study is that it's kind of got these two lives. Um, so as Carol shows everyone the wonderful uh, penguin suit picture of me, um, this project sort of, well, the independent study was sort of started like since my first year, because um, I sort of always had the interest in animation and stuff. I just didn't know how I really wanted to um, really implement it and everything. Um, it wasn't until second year that through digital demos, I figured out Unreal Engine was a thing. And then at some point you showed me um, and introduced me to Alyssa's project. Um, and then from there, it was really just sort of taking classes in the animation program to sort of figure out where I wanted to go um, until sort of the summer um, of last year, basically during when the pandemic started, um, kind of piecing together sort of all the influences and resources of what I really enjoyed it and sort of figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, I can't really say that there was ever a point where like I 100% knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, because this sort of started out as me just wanting to explore Unreal Engine and visualization and then kind of spiraled into more and more 
um, as it progressed. So it's sort of very, very different than that initial independent study I wrote up on the proposal about a year ago almost. Um, so yeah. I also just want to say um, a huge thank you to Carol Herman for connecting Sal Armeta and Eli Tuttle. Um, I actually don't think the project could be at the status that it is without the Zoom that we've done for the past year. Sal and Eli, you guys connected at first year reviews this time last year. And Eli has donated, and I got to give a big thanks to Eli because he has donated, honestly, countless hours to not just reviews for Sal, but reviews for Cabe as an alumni, but really working closely. We have had a meeting every Friday for the past year um, with very few breaks that everyone has, that, that this entire collective have shown up to. And then, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being Cabe centric here. I, have to, I also need to say hats off to Freddie Freeman who has done an absolutely amazing amount of preparation for this independent study, treating it as a fully fledged course um, with curriculum plans, weekly, you know, goals to hit that's really pushed Sal to the limit. And then also big thanks to Jason Kirk because um, his kind of ability to just like take Sal in and be like, yeah, we're gonna do this animation stuff, but you're a kooky architecture student. And so we're gonna do that too. Um, you don't have to do that. And it's made, it's made a huge amount of difference. So just the, the kind of, it's been a, it's been, it's been, I, I think that is all a testament to Sal's ability to bring people together as a team. And, and I think that's actually the ultimate transferable skill that you've got here, which is to like bring everybody along, build out the team that you need, take their criticism get people in the room who will nudge, poke, prod, and dissect this thing. Um, because this has changed drastically. Should go on to some of the images. I mean, that first slide seven, where we were in, I don't know, October, um, now just seems like ages, ages away. And then, you know, the donut lord did not get a, get his own slide in here, and that's fine. But like that was one of the very early renderings, just to see what the power of the computer was capable of, just to make a ridiculous image. Um, I think this has all been really key. The storyboarding course over at Deck also really key. Um, sorry, I just want to I want to get in the thank yous to everybody because there's so many people and and so many people that have been involved in this. It's really it's really amazing to see just how many points of the university had um, an impact on this project. Also, now that Andrew's brought up the Donut Lord, uh, the process book from last semester is in the chat in case anyone wants to see that image. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sal. I love the Donut Lord. Yeah, I just wanted to add a note too. Like, I wanted to just thank Sal for, it was, I feel like it was like almost like a snowball the way he like, uh, managed to get all these different people to like connect together and work on this project. And then I think like the idea when we were talking about transferable skills, from my perspective, it's almost like Sal's flexibility and his like openness to be able to work with like all these different disciplines, you know, the idea of like connecting with Kirk and being like, hey man, I, you know, I'm, I'm studying architecture, but I really want to learn more about animation and, and how does that skill work with like uh, architecture and I think you know ultimately through the idea of probably like play and exploration he learned so much more uh, and that was like really transferable into what he was trying to do with VR too and I think connecting with Eli uh, you know an industry professional and like being open to his feedback too it was it was never I feel like Eli was very upfront about his feedback I, I so. <laughs> it's, a, it's a waste of time otherwise right Eli? Yep. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but all the feedback like sal was able to kind of process and like it reinterpret and put in into the project in his own way too and i, I think that was like you know from a student you, even working beyond like the level i think like a student would normally work at was part of like what made the project su successful too and then i think like you know, from my perspective, Sal was like, I want to make this VR thing. And I was like, no, 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 you don't. What you really want to do is you want to research like what you're going to make. And he was like, 
uh okay i guess so yeah yeah all right and then that that like influenced the you know the the final approach for for what was going to happen and these were you know from my perspective it, i was trying to kind of like interject some like software development software design user experience skills into like the architecture process which is like new and different and i think like sal really picked up on that and it, you know changed the course of what he was making and and ultimately i think like you know he came up with something that was like new and innovative and you know it, it dealed with like creativity and exploration in a, a new way too and like professionally like looking at these slides right now it just gave me a i haven't been in the office in five in a year but you walk through the, stu the game studio and that's what you see on the walls you see sticky notes of where the beats, where the where we need to add more stuff. Where's the storyboards? Where's the we get documents back from Activision of here's all the user research we sent out. We had people who've never played Call of Duty. We've had people who played for 15 years. Here's all what they said, and that's posted up on the wall. It's not pretty pictures for the designers. So all of this stuff that you've done, you didn't know you were just mirroring what's done professionally, but that's what a studio, a game studio looks like. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to add something to what Frederick said, which was that um, I was at a design, a, a, a design 10 review the other day and the student said, well, you know, we didn't get, we didn't start designing until the very end of the semester. I was like, no, 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 no. All that research, all that work that you did that builds up to understanding what the project is and what you need to know and how you need to do it. That's relevant design work one, and it's relevant in any design discipline. You have to have, you have to, you have to frame your question before you start making stuff. Uh, you know, Andrew, thank you for all the kind words about deck and animation. And I just wanted to correct you on one thing. You said that we had an architecture student that came into animation and it, I didn't have to, you know, take that and put that in a framework of, of you know, this, this is an architecture student. How can we use these skills for that guy? When you get a kid like Saul darkening your door, you absolutely have to, <laughs> you know, you can't, he's not going to let you otherwise, uh, you know, uh, service those needs that he has. But it's also really kind of easy to do with a situation like this where, you know, the, the, the kind of linchpins of this thing are narrative, right? That's what we do. It's about putting your eye and your attention and your understanding somewhere within the rectangle or in VR's case, the sphere, which terrifies me. So I was really, it was really interesting to see <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, what he was able to do with that kind of thing. But the two kind of go hand in hand and, and it's almost every semester that I get an architecture or two students coming to sit in my animation classes. And uh, it's always a super treat to see how they approach problem solving and to see uh, the difference in familiarity with kind of um, vectors and 3D space that these guys have and how they use that. And um, it helps my students immensely to see, you know, uh, I remember one of the first weeks I had Saul in an animation course, he couldn't figure out what was wrong with the renderer we were teaching in the classroom. So he just brought his homework in, in Unreal, in real time, and put it up on the screen like it was no <laughs> thing. And it was just like, hey, we couldn't figure out render man. So here's that thing in a game engine that you don't teach so that we can you know overcome this hurdle and it was like that day on and i was like all right let's keep giving this guy problems to solve because that's you know he's really good at it and so it's been a pleasure for me to i haven't been as available as uh other advisors um on this project but every single time i stopped in i was blown away by uh kind of how far we went from the last time i spoke to this group and um I'm definitely gonna, you know, bring this over to the other side of the fence and start waving it around too, because I, you know, I think that uh, this is a testament to a lot of great work and a lot of departments and a lot of advisors and a lot of even students and individuals outside of the university. Um, you know, Sal carried this the whole way, but like, like everyone's saying here, he's he's really 
Uh, one of the great skills here is the, the coalition that you've generated to, Saul's not gonna look at anything and say, I don't know how to do that, so I'm not gonna do it. And one step further than that, Saul's not gonna look at something he doesn't know how to do and do it by himself, right? And that's one of the really strong things out of this project is that not only is he overcoming these challenges, but he's saying, you know, um, who would I wanna be if I had to overcome these challenges, let's get them in the room. Let's put them in the conversation. And that's really what excellent and informed and, um, you know, uh, pervasive design is, no matter what you're making out of what, right? Um, it's having those people in the room that can speak. And, you know, Frederick, uh, Freddie did a really excellent job of kind of galvanizing that by saying, you know, well, if that's the approach, let's really take uh, kind of a, an academic approach to this and do the research to say, you know, well, who do we want in the room, <laughs> you know, and, and, and expertise or not, what is that voice uh, adding to this? So really the combination of all this is really impressive and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here at the end of it. Uh, it's emotional, <laughs> you know, I think all of us have worked on this really hard and, and, and it shows. Thank you, Saul. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, I think just like uh, from my perspective too, just like, uh, I don't know, I guess like as the advisor for the emotional wrap up too, uh, I think like the only real comment that I have is, is kind of like what Kurt picked up too was it, it like it's really cool to see the trailer at the end, the playthrough. And I wonder, you know, again, like eight months six months if you stop for working on it that's you know it doesn't matter it's it's kind of up to you um but i have a feeling you won't stop working on it like it'd be nice to indicate almost like this is like a trailer gameplay trailer concept gameplay trailer and then having that footage of people like fumbling through even if it's like a little earlier on in your uh, your presentation to show like, hey, here's somebody testing out like one scene um, just to get like a flavor of, of like what other people would be experiencing. Cause it's like, I don't know, the design and everything is so beautiful too. But um, I think that would give you a little more leeway when you're presenting it as well. So people would say like, oh, okay. I, I, I kind of see and understand now this is how like users first uh, try to explore the, the experience. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, you're able to show like your entire uh, playthrough of that experience too. But ultimately I think like, you know, again, it's like an amazing job, just, you know, taking, taking what you had and, and turning it into this like really, really thoughtful and uh, I don't know, really well-developed like experience. So, so thank uh I have a quick question for you about this, just just for my own sake. What's broken? <laughs> like, like, what is it that we can't tell? Looking at this, is totally boring. What did he clutch? Yeah, where, um, where's the where's like the game breaking bug? Uh, zero day. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's not too many game breaking bugs. Um, there's a couple parts where there's like rocks and stuff that are kind of clipping through walls that I had to uh kind of expertly edit out from the video. Um, this sequence is actually the exact same sequence from the very beginning um, because I realized that when the path falls down in the uh, second level I set up for it, because uh, I kind of had this set up so when you approach that pile and it like physically changes the level in Unreal, um, on the second version of this, that path didn't actually fall. It just played the audio, so I kind of just cut in the beginning again. Um, and then there's a few spots in the terrain where um, the sort of teleporting pathing is a little buggy and so like teleports you into the ground. You, you spent a year on this, right? <laughs> and the second you publish it, everybody's gonna find all that stuff in like the first three hours of it being on Steam, right? And Eli can speak to this, right? You, this is my least favorite thing about my time in game design <laughs> is that you can design the hell out of a game in, in seven ways to Sunday until you're bleeding out of your eyes and think that you fixed everything. And then some speedrunner is going to figure it out <laughs> in like 
15 minutes so that like, oh, you can teleport to the last box by like, you know, jumping backwards off the star square of the game and who knows where these nerds are, right? Why aren't they on your team doing the yeah. QA work to help you? Hire those guys. <laughs> How can you break out of the map in less than 24 hours when nobody <laughs> in your entire 500 QA team could do it? Uh, what, whatever you think you solve, they'll, they'll break it immediately. So I got a quick follow-up question to that. So what was your favorite and your least favorite uh, part of working on this entire thing? Uh, question. Honest, I, too, all, all <laughs> I think uh, my favorite part of it was, I guess, kind of obviously like doing all of like the in-engine stuff, um, sort of all of the kind of like setting up the scenes, um, setting up all the lighting, kind of like really exploring the spaces. Um, I will admit the uh, user research aspect for me was a little bit uh, slow, but uh, I'm sure that's mostly just because uh, I don't really have the background for it. Um, and then other than that, um, just the constant fixing of those little like bugs and stuff until I finally decided to just give up on it and just edit those out in the video. Um, that is perfectly acceptable, by the way. That is how every game trailer has ever been made. And some of the bugs you were talking about would be listed as uh, like either depending on your rating, a C bug or like a P3. Like it's not mm -hmm. a rock clipping through a wall, totally shippable. <laughs> if, yeah. if you no go man's like, sky, that yep. two and a half years. <laughs> um, in, in Anthem, in the prologue scene, there's a spot where there's a bridge. There's some rocks on the bridge. And if you fly underneath the bridge, you can see underneath every single rock. It goes out there. You're teleporting into the world. That's eh, a that's a little more important. But, Sal, I can totally relate yeah. to uh, what you said about the user research. Um, being a researcher who just wants to make stuff is like the hardest part of being, you know, someone who makes stuff and being a researcher mm -hmm. at the same time. It's that's a hard um, that's a hard rope to balance on for sure. And I feel started. good. I feel like if you didn't like it, then I feel like maybe I did my job. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I definitely I learned a lot from it. <laughs> I got to say, we do we do program analysis and we do, you know, user and inhabitant citizen, you know, feedback and community engagement. And UX is just a different skin for that same problem. And the approach is is similar, but also very different. It was really educational just for me since you guys were meeting in my Zoom room so that I could listen in. And most days I ended up putting down what I was working on to just listen in completely because it was really, really invaluably useful. I just want to point out that Carol Herman found one of the Easter eggs already. Carol Getting doesn't even understand what you just said. Uh, Sal labored probably way too long over the hieroglyphs. Probably way too long. And... There's um there's a bunch of stuff in there that we actually had to yell at him uh, and encourage him not to spend the time on because he needed to spend the time elsewhere. Um, and uh, I believe it was like a week ago that Eli was like, stop messing around with the Easter eggs. You're the only person that's going to find them. And uh, just like Eli just said, it's up for three hours and somebody finds it. Not that they would be the only one to find it, but he's the only one that was invested that much. Yeah. Yeah. He had other stuff he had to get done. Yeah. Just so everyone else knows, all the hieroglyphs are Aubrey from Star Wars. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Eli's right about that Easter egg stuff. I struggle with this with animation students all the time who want to like name their designer after me or whatever. And I'm like, I, I've settled on the advice that if your user is going to go, huh, that's about as much time as you should put into making it as well. <laughs> yeah. Maybe those hieroglyphs would be cool if they were Star Wars. Huh. All right, and, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> and know, the and best thing, the best thing to do is put in something that's easy. We have a guy on our team that there is a rubber ducky in every level he's worked on. Doesn't matter what level. And then the biggest Easter egg is we designed a map that had a giant rubber ducky with his name on it. Nice. So there's your Easter egg. And it's so simple because it's plop one asset. But creating new texture sheets, figuring out what it all says. I'm glad you took the advice and worked on the other stuff because it, it rounded out your presentation. 
Oh man, yeah. So I think just to jump back on the the user experience thing too, I think the interesting part is like it was like a, more of like a reductive, like subtractive approach. I think we took where you know when the semester started, Sal had like almost like an endless supply of just stuff and things that were like usable and like cool and different directions. And then I think maybe that was the unfun part where it was the user research where it was like why do you want to add that? Why do you want to do that? <laughs> you know, like, what's that for? So it was more of like questioning, like, you know, maybe these like amazing potential paths that could have uh, happened or different directions it, it could have went, but then it turned into more of like, you know, why did, why do you want to add that? Can we take that out of it? So it, it's more of streamlining and less like, uh, I think like endless additions. It's about thinking about your effort into something like this as a container for quality, right? And, you know, you only have so much, when we talked about this at the beginning of the, the project, so uh, we started with kind of this, this idea of, you have all these ideas, you have X amount of quality that you can put into a container and the size of the container, right? Um, you know, if I have a, a gallon jug and an ounce of quality, <laughs> right, then I've got a pretty empty thing, you know, but if I've got a, an ounce and a half container and an ounce of quality that I put into that thing, it seems flushed out and full. So that reductive approach to it uh, and kind of choosing what you can do with your time on something like this is it, where the mistakes are made or not made, right, it, is saying tomorrow I'm going to spend time on X, Y, and Z, right? And until I get it working, you know, versus like th that idea of like, it, it's fun to put Easter eggs in. It's fun to kind of build a space out that you care about personally. Um, but the real, the real challenge is making a space that everyone cares about, <laughs> you know, that becomes the future Easter egg <laughs> for like, remember, <laughs> uh, remember that, that, that hieroglyph we touched in that game, it's here too. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I really appreciate kind of Frederick, your, Freddie, your, your, your addition to this is, is really great with that kind of user experience input and kind of the research-based approach to creating something like this. And, you know, when, when you look at somebody like Saul, who, who has, you know, kind of the ambition and the drive to make stuff like this, it's really hard to find the right constraints for an individual like Saul, who's just going to go full tilt at it, right? So, and I, and I love his answer that the 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 user research that you put him through was the tedium, <laughs> and you're absolutely right that if he enjoyed that too much, you probably didn't do it right. You know, <laughs> uh, but I think that like I, I, I again that speaks to what I said earlier about getting the right people in the right place. You know, like you found the constraint that made this kind of work for Saul and not be, you know, the white void in the background. There's an island floating now, <laughs> you know, and we can all stand on it and it's terra firma and move around with it. So that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love hearing about like kind of the, you've got big ideas. Let's focus in on, you know, the part that doesn't need to be blurry. Good stuff. What's the deal with the, uh, the the thing right there you're throwing out? The little, um, is that movement? Are you doing like- Yeah, that's, um, so I originally wanted to just have like smooth locomotion on it where you kind of just push on the control stick yeah, and it moves you normally. Um, but obviously that would have taken time to fully actually like properly implement. Um, and so I just didn't bother, but that is just sort of the teleporting arc that Unreal Engine has built in for you. You're, you're taking me back to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself here, not that the younger folks will know what I'm talking about, but uh, this is how you used to move around in Shadowbane. Yeah. Eli, are you with me on Shadowbane? Oh, yeah. 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 It was like an early, early graphical MMO. And rather than have WASDA controls, you would just click on the ground where you wanted to be. And it was, it was extra janky when like, you know, a centaur is trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's also right. It's also the Google maps way. It's true. It's yeah. There it is for sure. Low fi and it, it's, it's relatively stable. Um, hey, next, Sal, two part question. What's next for you 
And what's next that you see us doing or students that want to come up and, you know, you built on Alyssa's, if a student wants to build on your stuff, what's the, what's the pay it forward? Um, so for me, I mean, I'm planning to kind of reorganize this entire presentation into like process books, similar to what I made uh, for last semester. Um, and then obviously I'm probably going to work on it a little bit more. Um, I do want to, at the very least, fix up a few things um, and then kind of get it all packaged to store onto the um, VR backpacks for OIR. Um, that way it's there for anyone else at the university to kind of try out, um, as well as the Unreal file for the exploration of it. Um, and then, I mean, if students want to sort of explore something similar to this, I would say to basically start bugging you, Kirk and Eli and Freddie um, as much as possible <laughs> um, to also get like dump the information and context for it. I will also dump Severino Alfonso and Kihan Ku in there and Carol, who's the one who um, introduced me to the fact that this could be a possibility for you and yeah. Yeah, you got to find basically all like, you know, the crazy out there professors and the ones that kind of like know everyone. Here we are. Uh <laughs> I'll, I'll dump also on them some personal work of open up Unreal. See if you actually want to do it. As Saul, Saul has embraced this greatly and he loves it. But he's making it sound like roses and candy water. Oh, it's totally yeah. not. It's, totally <laughs> but it's not. like rendering in a video game. Right. So find out if you want to do it. Um, if you just want to take it straight architecture wise, there's some awesome tutorials on Unreal and how to render your, your designs beautifully. Like that's when I started this process 15 years ago. Thank you, Jefferson University for reminding me with that email. Um, it was about doing that. Like, how can I just use 3D to just show a space? And I envisioned this. I knew I didn't have the skills to do it or the tools to do it to this degree. But the way architecture is gone, you can do all of your high-vis renderings in Unreal. So that's a great starting point to see if you really want to do it and find all those pitfalls right away. Yeah, I would also just add that um, anyone who does want to learn Unreal Engine and struggles with it are free to contact me um, because while there are a lot of tutorials on it, there's also a lack of tutorials on it in some things. Um, so sometimes it's just like a lot of struggle kind of Googling for like the right video for your like exact problem. Hey, Saul, this is kind of funny. I got a big question that I don't think has been uh addressed yet and if it has you got to forgive me but what is this called uh the name from <laughs> last semester was dimensional pylons um and i've kind of just been referring to this as you know dimensional pylons vr attack um, the donut lord unfortunately i'm kind of terrible at naming so the name is technically still a work in progress but as of right now it's just you know dimensional pylons vr edition and stuff from last semester is dimensional pylons paper edition when are you releasing your nft <laughs> <laughs> no once i pretty this thing up a little bit then i'm actually totally gonna start uh selling nfts for it all right well send me some stls so i can 3d print your environment and play it uh play with i'll, I'll develop the live tabletop <laughs> rule set for it uh Not the skill figurine yeah i got you let's go Kirk, I, I feel like you, that was a good point too. So it's like, you know, this project is, there's like a level of insanity to this project where it's almost like never ending. And you're just like, hey, wait a second. What's the name of this? Like, is it, you know, like what's the branding? Like, who, you know, you start to get oh, into this. <laughs> I see myself like, you know, having a conversation with somebody who wasn't here in an hour, like this kid made this thing and it's rad. And, <laughs> you know, and if you wanted to Google it, <laughs> yeah, what yeah, would yeah. You do, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, dimensional pylons. You got to like, 
you got to mix it up a little bit though and like throw the y from pylons into the dimensional somehow and then take the i from dimensional and put it in the pylons so i'll, I'll get, uh, get a graphic designer to uh, make me a nice logo for 3. it 0.14 yeah um, yeah, it's like what next? Do you just throw this up on Kickstarter? Like, what's going on? <laughs> it's in it's in Steam early access. <laughs> uh, it, it actually legit could be. I think um, fix your waterfalls in the last shot, and then you're good yeah. to go. Yeah, I gotta get um, some like better waterfall particles. That like thirty or... eighty you bought for this project isn't helping. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately that's uh the fault of unreal engine sparkle system and the crappy yeah. tutorial i followed when i made that yeah this is, this is some old school sprites it, it takes me back i'm into it i've the current project i'm on i've had a designer pitch a waterfall in three different maps no mm -mm. they're hard yeah, yeah i don't want to mess with waterfalls yeah. it's like the the cg uh what is it it's like the CG plateau. <laughs> We've stopped at waterfalls. Anything more complex, we're done. <laughs> it's not worth the budget. I, I would say, like, art-wise, it's the... You, you brought it up. Like, start going... Go back to some of like, slide. I think it's uh, 36 or 35, maybe. Nope. Nope, I'm wrong. Go 34. Yeah. this to that get more yeah. in there mm -hmm. you you nailed your 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 concept shot here you're it's all diagrammed out just build that up more yeah you know for sure. another next two weeks so if we're doing visual crit, uh, I feel like I'm late to that party because I missed a few of these meetings for sure. But um, one thing for me I'm always looking for is being colorblind um, mm -hmm. and advocating for others like me, uh, especially in interactive experiences and games. There are entire games I can't play because they're not accessible from a colorblind uh, standpoint. And I want to play them all. So, <laughs> you know, that sucks. Uh, one thing I would say is in the floating island sections, right? Um, you know, you've got kind of a, a monotone color palette for all of these arenas that, that we're in that we move around and that's okay. But when you have something I like can uh, keep it there. Uh, when you have something in the uh, draw that, that yeah, all right. When you have this right like someone like me misses that every time, you know, that bleeds into everything around it. And I think that what you're hoping is that the right angles the the, the straight lines that are never going to occur in all these rocks is is going to catch my eye mm -hmm. um some things you can do if you don't want to keep that if you want to keep that kind of blended in you've got it uh, are there any other slides with this uh asset on them uh no that's currently the only one um, all right that's fine so you see how you get this little spec uh this this little specular contribution yeah. on the side of the the guys it's a reflection i'm using big words um you see how you get the reflection there there's ways that you could cheat the reflection on this asset to be not the color of this sky but to be some other thing right mm -hmm. so if you wanted to keep this the idea being that like maybe this was constructed using these raw materials surrounding it by whatever mysterious entity did it one way you could cheat the, the eye being pulled to that very important wayfinding marker right is to have that specular contribution be like a contrasting color to this blue hazy that we're seeing so if like you had like the specular color on this shader as a red right or as an orange your eye would catch that every single time and then it would be doing something weird and then when something's doing something weird your user starts to scratch their head and they want to go touch it and they want to go see why it's weird and then once they get there it points them to the next thing mm -hmm. so think about that and like one of the biggest things about what you're essentially doing here is 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 video game environment design right you're not only you know when i talk to you in my animation class about we're trying to put your eye on the rectangle and get it to go where we want it to go and think feel what we understand mm -hmm. what we want you to think feel understand um 
you're doing a thing here where it's not just on the rectangle. You want to push them into the sphere. And like I said earlier, that's what scares me about VR is now that rectangle is a dome around your head and you know, it's too much, right? <laughs> it's too much possibility. They, they're all going to go the wrong way. Um, but yeah. So how do you do that? How do you create, it's almost like inception, right? Like how do you create the idea that we want to go touch this thing, but like it was my idea to go touch the thing, not some guy yeah. who made a choice on a shader in unreal. Yeah. But making the choice on the shader in Unreal that says people are going to come here and they're going to want to like spin this thing, you know. Yeah, the, so the, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was um, I was going to say, Kirk, I like that you're you're bringing that in because I've been spending a lot of time on um, getting ready to do some audio stuff over the summer, and I've been spending a lot of time working with um, people who are either hearing impaired or need um, either need um stuff written out or be able to listen in. So you have to be very explicit and conversation can be very difficult. And so you, you as much need to train everyone around you for how to speak into the record so that it can be clear. And um, it's, I think the other interesting aspect of this was that Freddie, that you and Sal started to explore how sound could be a part of this and really transform the space, not just kind of cue up, um, uh, either a soundtrack or sound effects, but really sound as part of the story. And the whispering, I mean, it's actually gotten much more, it, it kind of serves as this um, Geiger counter for whether you're on the path or not. And, but not in that, not in a Geiger counter kind of way, in a way where it really kind of builds the story and adds to it. So it's, I, I keep, we keep talking about this in architecture too, which is that when you make the design more, when you adopt universal design, which makes it more compatible for more for more people, it invariably benefits everybody, and and um, so it's not a cost added; it's a net benefit to all. And I think that the the visual um, the visual accessibility ideas, as well as the VR accessibility, which actually makes I think the game a lot more immersive and usable for all users, even non-native gamers. Um, and then also adding the sound to it. It's, it's interesting to kind of continue to push in that, which was not really a purpose of this study, but it adopted it again, because it's a net benefit to everybody. So why not just do it? Because that's, that's just good design. I, I was going to defend Saul a little. We did, we, when we started this semester, I would, it was a, how do you make all these images? How do you really do that composition? How do you get that eye to go through the, the sphere? And then it turned more into a UX level design process. So we didn't push him at all to address your your concerns there, which mm -hmm. are um, anybody who's interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> toys for toys for Bob, one of our sister studio, they did work on uh, Crash Bandicoot, uh, Spyro they spent months and months on crafting the visually impaired side of their game and how do you use color and how do you use contrast and colors on certain areas of certain silhouettes to help a player who doesn't have those spectrums to, to play. And it's fantastic. I don't know if they made it public. I hope they did. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic and in a way like it, relating back to architecture for those on the line you're going to have to deal with ADA stuff you know my wife she's an interior designer she's dealing with ADA on a project right now we still have it we still have to address it as as conscious game developers or conscious you know animators and film directors not everybody does it and I'll say I work on a game that does not do it well at all we have browns and greens everywhere and that's it. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, so that's kind of backstory of why some of that stuff was missing. Cause you know, for me, I'd say like, there's all this stuff you can like, what's the other high frequency like rebel that goes in here? Mm -hmm. What's yeah. the change of color that's in this path? You know, the, uh, you could do a, instead of building it in shader, you could put a, a spotlight that sits right here and only link only it to that asset that. 
Yeah. So it's only going to rim light that asset. Really what Eli's talking about is that advice that I give and I've given you before, Saul, it's when you create an image, right? Like these frames here, what you need to do is take off your glasses and squint mm -hmm. until you can't see anything but a blur. And if your eye is still catching the thing that you want your eye to be catching when you look at it full vision, you're doing your job, right? If you can step 10 feet back from this and squint and, and still catch the pylon and still catch the path and still catch the silhouette in the background of the place you're ultimately going, that's a win, right? But if you squint and it's just like, you know, instead of a big dark blur, I see a big light blur, <laughs> you know, uh, then, then you had issues. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it was, I, I appreciate, Eli, you jump into to Saul's defense and, and that's awesome to hear about. Um, I need to check out those Spyro crash. Yeah. Yeah, those remasters look good. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't more of a like, why didn't you do this? It's a like, why don't you do this? Oh, <laughs> you know, figuring to move forward. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, there's a ton of students that have stuck in this entire time, an hour and a half. Brenna Carley, Owen Felty, Jacqueline Forlett. Florero, no pizza, guys. Ryan McMahon, and Des. <laughs> Des, you joined a little bit later. I'm just wondering, like, if you guys have questions, like, what the heck is this? Um, Brenna, you've you've gotten to work with Sal a lot this semester. I was wondering what kind of thoughts or hopes you have going forward for you. You did a you did a really cool audio animation with Natasha in um, Design Four. Owen, oh, I I know that you're you're either rooching around or you're like jumping up and down behind that, behind that uh, logo. So I was just wondering if you guys, I don't know, had questions. There's a lot less people online now too. So um, I was just wondering. Um, yeah, I'm, Twigs left. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was really like, I'm just really enjoying the conversations that's going on um, regarding sales project. I think he, having seen it, uh, at a couple of different points um i think he progressed it to a really amazing spot and i was kind of blown away by the final product um yeah i i really liked just like a note on on the sound um i really like the the whispering i feel like that added like more depth uh to the visual elements that we were seeing with the story um and it kind of it, it left me wondering more about uh the narrative which i thought was really interesting I had wished it was like, I liked it as well. I wished it was more intelligible and that like, you know, I love the idea of it being a Geiger counter for the right way to go. And then like, when you get closer and closer, it could become more intelligible to the, to the point where you're almost able to decipher something. And then mm -hmm. like, you have, you have anchor elements within this experience that you could tie that directly to. If it's a translation of the hieroglyph, for instance, right? Um, then you've got something that like, that's a real Easter egg, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right? Where like, you can totally, um, totally guide those things. And then, you know, we talked a lot in this project, um, all you youngsters out there, go check it out afterward. But we talked a lot in this project about that game, Mist, right? Mm -hmm. And that game is all about picking up on environmental clues and letting it guide your exploration. And I, I've been playing those games my entire life. Uh, and the, 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 the puzzles I always failed the most at were the ones where you relied on audio, where it was like a different tone to like go the right or wrong way, you know? Um, so that's a, yeah, you know, there's a, a whole other layer of interactivity that not having audio involved would have um you know bereaved us of and and this would be lacking and almost to the extent where you'd be wondering why you know like what's missing here i don't know right but good audio good sound is exactly the kind of detail that your audience if you've done it right isn't going to notice right it's going to be a part of the thing mm -hmm. if you've done it wrong or haven't done it at all your audience isn't going to know what's missing and it's going to bother them you know it's like a shadow. Like if you don't see someone's shadow in a room full of people who have shadows, you're like someone forgot a checkbox in their renderer. You know. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say they're a vampire. Yeah, either that, right? Either or. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I I love the idea of like not only you know having audio. We we talk a lot 
you know, animation, as you've learned in my classes, is a lot of work, right? It's it's too much work yeah. for any any sane individual to undertake. So we push all the time in like senior films and other projects, what can you animate with audio, right? Like what can we show the audience non-visually all the time without having to create another frame, right? Uh, and audio is a way to do that. Um, we have a joke, Lowell Boston is another professor. Um, we have a joke where every time we say audio is X percent of your film, it's just another random high number. <laughs> right we never give a, a certain formula that it's 35 percent of your film we're always just like throw out another big it's 66 percent of your film today <laughs> you know for this shot it's 90 percent of your film but yeah uh the the idea of layering the audio with the visual to, to pull us along is really really strong here i just want to uh welcome jeff Seeple to the to the mix um Jeff, uh, what you're seeing is Sal's um, kind of teaser trailer playthrough of his VR architecture game collab between um, Cave and Deck. And the, we were we were looking at it before. It's kind of the, um, you came to some of the uh, background meetings. Um, we've had those going on for a year because uh, Eli Tuttle has been with us for now over, actually over a year. Sal and he met last yeah. year and we met throughout the summer. And um and Thanks so much for the replay. Yeah, problem. Well, I also started. added the uh, full presentation into the chat so you can kind of flip through it. Oh, yeah. thanks. So, and also Sal was just saying that um, he's going to format these so that so that it can get loaded onto the backpack so other students can actually play this project. Um, oh, because what you're seeing, great. yeah. So what you're seeing is kind of a single playthrough from a single person, but it's a VR environment, and so it actually plays with sound, and you can explore it. Um, to a certain degree, although Olivia told us how many times she's teleported into rock, but hey, that's just part of the design process. I think almost every single time she went through it, she teleported into something. It's that, it's that you know, it's because she's really interested in the mycelia of the rock, so she's just getting really, Olivia's working on her own independent study that deals with bro growing architecture from fungi, so. Guys, I, uh, I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to have to go ahead and get out for my next uh, appointment yeah. here, but saw really good work. Uh, super great to, um, you know, super proud to have my name somewhere on this project at all, you know. Uh, so I, I appreciate you rolling me into this. Uh, it's been great to see your progress uh, starting in my animation classes, but, you know, to, to keep contacting me afterward has been an absolute pleasure. So keep up the good work. Um, we're neighbors, so come bang on my door or let me know and I'll come. Uh, check this out for real. Uh, but yeah, good, good work, everybody. Um, Andrew, as always, it's, it's excellent being in a room, having a conversation with you every single time. It's a great uh, excuse to get with you. Yeah, anytime. Let's do it again. Uh, yeah. Freddie, I really appreciate you helping um, Saul out with this. Uh, it, it was, uh, you know, when we had the conversation earlier in the semester, Saul, or before the semester, I was like, what are you doing for the independent study? This? And you're like, I've got Freddie. I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> you know, I was like, like sweet he's in good hands uh but uh yeah I'm glad to have been a part of this uh in any capacity whatsoever and um if it helped uh, at all uh it's it, it's been my pleasure and then Eli really good to meet with you um you know it's funny being somebody who does this in academics and, and teaches and you know kind of often wonders if what I'm teaching is the right direction towards what they'll be experiencing when they hit the ground in front of a workstation. And my conversations with you have like, you know, helped me sleep at night. They're like, yeah, that's it still is. how they make, yeah, that's still how they make games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, Tools have changed process and mindsets yeah. pretty safe. Right. Right. So anyway, uh, it's great to see all you guys. Uh, thanks for all the students that hung out. Jeff, yeah. uh, thanks for tagging me out here, um, <laughs> Texas tornado style. And Mike, I'll talk to you soon enough, I'm sure. Absolutely. All right, guys, have a good one. See thanks, you, Kurt. See you, Kurt. Two hours, two hours of review just because people thought it was that interesting, including Alexa Hayes, who was only going to be here for like 20 minutes, and she stayed for over an hour.